Whatever kind of night you're having, start it off right with Drizzly, the go-to app for drink delivery. Whether you're mixing up a bullet bourbon old-fashioned for a cozy night in, or kettle one Bloody Mary bar for a birthday brunch, you can get the perfect beer, wine, and spirits for any occasion delivered with Drizzly. So what's it gonna be? Download the Drizzly app or go to drizzly.com. That's D-R-I-Z-L-Y dot com to choose your drinks today. Must be 21 plus, not available in all locations. Ready to pop the question? The jewelers at BlueNile.com have got sparkle down to a science with beautiful lab-grown diamonds worthy of your most brilliant moments. Their lab-grown diamonds are independently graded and guaranteed identical to natural diamonds, and they're ready to ship to your door. Go to BlueNile.com and use promo code WELCOME to get $50 off your purchase of $500 or more. That's code WELCOME at BlueNile.com for $50 off. BlueNile.com. When it comes to teaching kids and teens about money, practice makes perfect. That's where Greenlight comes in. With a debit card and money app of their own, kids learn to earn, save, spend wisely, and invest. Parents send instant money transfers, create custom chores, and automate allowance while kids track their spending, set savings goals, and practice money skills they can use today and for life. Get one month free when you sign up at greenlight.com slash podcast. Looking for a fun way to win 25 times your money this football and basketball season? Test your skills on Prize Picks, the most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Just select two or more players, pick more or less on their projection for a wide variety of stats, and place your entry. It's as easy as that. If you have the skills, you can turn $10 into $250 with just a few taps. Easy gameplay, quick withdrawals, and injury insurance on your picks are what make Prize Picks the number one daily fantasy sports app. Ready to test your skills? Join the Prize Picks community of more than 7 million players who have already signed up. Right now, Prize Picks will match your first deposit up to $100. Just visit prizepicks.com slash play100 and use code play100. That's code play100 at prizepicks.com slash play100 for a first deposit match up to $100. Prize Picks, daily fantasy sports made easy. Hello, this is international football commentator Derek Ray, and you're listening to the Ranks FC podcast. Hello, Rank Squad, and welcome to Ranks FC. It's time for your Champions League takeaway. Recording straight after Wednesday's games, we're going to take a look back at all four of the games in the Champions League this week, where Bayern Munich, AC Milan, Chelsea, and Benfica have qualified for the quarterfinals. My name is Jack Collins, and I'm joined by the Rank Squad, Mr. Sam Tai. How you doing, mate? Yes, mate. Very good. Thank you. Very good indeed. And of course, our transfer guru, Mr. Dean Jones. How are you doing, mate? Hello, mate. Yeah, very good. Better than all the Tottenham fans that live around this sort of area will be feeling right now after what they've just witnessed. But we'll get on to that in a minute. I don't think we'll start with that one. No, I, I don't think we will. I mean, tonight wasn't a great night of football, I thought, generally. It was one of those evenings where the whole... Oh, Shebang says a Europa a League bit. fan. Here he goes. Here <laughs> Look, I tell you what, you never get you never get this in the Europa League. There are no dull nights in the Europa League. It just doesn't happen, I'm afraid. And that's why I it's still Europe's can't believe you're not on their payroll. You're still coming out on this. I know. One day, one day we can but dream. But let's get into our Champions League takeaways. Sam, you're gonna start us off with Bayern Munich two, PSG nil. Yeah, and 3-0 on aggregate. So uh, looks like a bit of a clean sweep. Wasn't really the case, to be honest with you, overall. Uh, and for basically the entirety of the first leg and 60 minutes of the second leg, this was quite tight. But in the end, obviously, Bayern kind of ran away with it. Probably should have scored more. PSG, of course, due to the game state, opened up and pushed and pushed and pushed and committed resources forward, left gaps at the back. And really, if Leroy Sané was remotely finical or any good at making decisions on the break, they genuinely could have won this this leg tonight by four goals. But uh, look, I've got three takeaways for you. I'm going to start with a bit of praise for Dayot Upamakano, who I think is finally at the point that people kind of thought he was a couple of years ago. I'm ready and willing to put him into the world-class bracket 
of cent- center backs. And you know, this is a big step for me, guys. You know, I, I've long been someone who uh, has not I mean, doubters, doubted him's not the word, but I've been had reservations, is probably how I hmm. phrase it. Yeah, 100%. And like, you know, two, two or three years ago, he was on the Champions League stage still, but he put in some really poor performances every now and then. And there was a particular game when he used to play for Leipzig um, during lockdown where he was absolutely atrocious in the latter stages. And um, he's really he's really kind of grown. And it's okay. Like young players are allowed to grow. They're allowed to improve. We do have a habit as a football watching community of crowning players a little bit too early. But I think we're finally there. The year has been sensational for Upper Mercado. He was amazing at the World Cup and he has been completely and utterly flawless in two legs against PSG here, against Neymar and Mbappe and Messi and anything else that they can throw at him. He has been flawless. I like the fact actually that basically the entirety of Bayern's back five all had like a moment in this game where they all got to kind of like fist pump or shout or scream or the commentator had to lavish praise on them. Obviously, De Ligt had the goal line clearance. Fonzu Davies had that amazing last man tackle on uh, Mbappe in the box late on. Stanisic was fantastic. He deserves his own podcast, really stepping into this and, and playing so well. But Upper Meccano, to get through 180 minutes against Neymar, and Messi, Mbappe and co and not make a single mistake is genuinely unbelievable. And I think he deserves his own takeaway. And I think he deserves his praise. I'd completely agree. The only, the only thing I would say is that I thought that both him and Delict barely put a foot wrong across the two legs. Mm-hmm. And they're really growing into a partnership. You know, it felt like we, I sang Pumagana's praises after the first leg, and I thought the lick tonight was pretty much faultless. But I think you could probably say either or in both situations. Those are two players who have, have stood up to be counted and two players who people questioned quite heavily. Now, we weren't sure if Bayern were going to play a back three or a back four. It did sort of alternate at times, but mostly sh- shifted itself to a three. But I just genuinely thought that over the two legs, both the lick and Pumagana have stood up and been like, right, We've arrived and they were both young centre backs. That's the thing, you know, and they, they've, I think tonight and, and over the, the two legs, we've seen Delict displaying why people were so hot on him at Ajax and Upa Meccano displaying why people were so hot on him at Leipzig. And finally, it feels like these two, where there were questions and reservations, are starting to become the kind of go to pair for sure for Nagelsmann. And they're starting to live up to those golden boy bet world-class tags that were being put on them from such an early age. Yeah, for sure. And Upper Meccano's role was very interesting. So he played in the middle of the back three this evening and he he basically was asked to double up on either side. So he was helping the players either side of him. So I think usually typical logic is that you would put the faster centre-backs on the outside because they'd play in the channel. So you'd expect them to be up against the Mbappe runs more. But Nagelsmann put his fastest centre-back in the middle put the slower ones either side of him and then said to Upper Meccano, you need to play basically your role in the middle, but then you also need to play right centre-back and left centre-back at the same time. And I want you to flip across depending on which side of the pitch the ball is on. And I want you to help Delict, and I want you to help Stanisic and I want you to become the inside cover man. So it's always 2v1. Anyone that PSG get into the channel is 2v1. It's one defender and Upper Meccano is just coming around on the inside just to cover and block off maybe an inside cut. It's very, it's very clever from Nagelsmann. It's a lot to ask of a young man. And he just nailed it. Like, absolutely nailed it. The more you look into the technical role that he played tonight and in the first leg, the more you just, the more you just think that was incredible. Absolutely incredible. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Right. What's number two then? Okay, I think this is the fastest game of football I think I've ever seen. <laughs> like <laughs> I, I was genuinely sat there watching both of the the flank battles. You know, Alfonso Davies against Ashraf Hakimi, which we got in the first leg, but Hakimi wasn't fit and came off at half time. He just he just wasn't there. He's fit tonight and he played tonight. And those two going head to head in sprint races and shoving each other off the ball and the bit where they sort of do a 20 yard sprint and then they turn on the six months and stop. And it's like, who can react quickest? It was absolutely genuinely thrilling. And then there was obviously the battle on the other side as well. Coman was playing kind of wing back and you know, he's ridiculously fast. Nuno Menge is ridiculously fast. Sané is ridiculously fast. Mbappe is the fastest of the lot, possibly. I sat there looking, watching the counting all the players on the pitch. I was like, this is absolutely absurd. Like, this is like a game of elite footballers who are also all like 100 meter professional sprinters. 
And there were times where these little one-on-one battles broke out. I was just sat there with the popcorn, just enjoying just like the the, the sheer basic kind of mano a mano like 1v1 sprint race stuff. It was awesome. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It, it was such a fast game. And I mean, I'm wary of seeing what your number one point is here, but the element of that that was to do with the fact that neither team were pressing is one of those things that jumps out because obviously yeah. PSG, and you tweeted something to this effect, PSG were fearful of the pace over the top. And then it kind of set it up for these spaces to sort of become races, if you will, rather than a player herring in behind with a centre back sort of chasing after them. I hesitate to say lumbering when Upamakana was on the pitch, but <laughs> with a centre back chasing after them, it didn't feel like that. It felt like these sprint races were, I'm going to knock it past you and then I'm going to see where we get to. And I think that those are really kind of interesting caveats with, with where we got to. Yeah, actually, I missed out on Upamakana from the list. I mean, he's ridiculously fast and, and he had a, probably three or four sprint races with Mbappe. Um, and he won all of them. You know, he didn't get sold by the dummy, the classic Mbappe fake dummy. He he read every single action Mbappe managed to put together, and Mbappe had a really quiet night. You know, he got he got in behind three four times. His first touch let him down quite a lot. To be honest with you, um, he got played in. He got he got the opportunities, but his first touch let him down. And and he is he is my final takeaway, and it's something a bit more overarching for PSG. Mbappe needs to have a really serious think about this now. Um, and I don't, I, I don't mean to, you know, pile on the misery for you know PSG fans listening and watching because they're obviously going to. It's tough to take. You, you knocked out the Champions League. This is the number one goal for the club, and and you're out again. It sucks. It really sucks. But if you're Mbappe, you need to think about this. Like, is this genuinely a window in which PSG can now win the Champions League? Like, we have to, we have to consider that, and he has to consider that as well. After you know committing last summer. Because you look at the makeup of the squad and you're not really sure if Messi's going to be around next season. You're not 100% sure that Neymar is. And you're not 100% sure what Neymar's going to give you when it comes to February and March anymore. And then their best player tonight was probably Sergio Ramos. He's out of contract at the end of the season. He's 36. He had their best chances on goal. The centre-back headers from a corner. Do you look at this team and this group and think, yeah, we're the right additions. We've got another two, three years. Do you genuinely, like Killian, do you look at this team and do you see that? Because I don't think I do. And if I was him, knowing that sprinters and very, very fast forwards have a shorter or earlier peak, a la Michael Owen, for example, and he's a, ha- he's a hamstring away from being, you know, 80% of the player. And that's, that's not to be too pessimistic. It just is what it is. I think he's in his peak right now. These players peak earlier, early 20s. Take a look at this team and, and ask yourself if this is the team you can win the Champions League with. I'm not so sure. Yeah, it's an interesting one, DJ, because I I imagine that there's going to be a lot of soul searching going on at PSG. And I'm not 100% sure that all of the blame lies at Galtier's door. It will be, of course, nailed to his mast. And I'd be very surprised if Galtier sees out the season. PSG have paid the price for coming second in their group, basically. In the early stages of this competition, they've been drawn against Bayern and they've been beaten by a side who are up there with the right up there with the best in Europe and and that's sometimes how the draw goes but I'm not 100% sure I I think this can all be blamed on the manager no of course it it can't all be I mean you can't just keep blaming the manager every time and it's this the same consequence every year is that PSG don't win the Champions League and it's not the same manager throughout that period but um, a lot of the same players are involved Obviously, you come back to it and you're like, how can a team with Mbappe and and Messi not get beyond the last 16 of the Champions League? Like you say, they've had the toughest draw they could possibly have got, so there's that. But still, they would have had to play Bayern at some stage anyway during this competition if they were going to go and win it. And this would probably have been the outcome anyway because Bayern just have that superiority over them. I mean, I think Mbappe probably stays, but it, it sounds right. There's a question to be asked now. The issue in the background is Neymar, to be honest. Like, Neymar misses half a season all the time. <laughs> like, like he, he always picks up problems that lead to long layoffs, and he's paid far too much money to miss that amount of time. The problem is, who's going to buy Neymar? Because he's on a long contract on ridiculous money. I don't know that you could actually get rid of one of these three. So I don't know. I don't know actually how it pans out with, with this attack. I'm not saying they want to get rid of any of them, but like if something's going to give, I'm not sure which one it is that gives. Um, looks like Messi is going to negotiate a new deal. 
pretty soon. At least that's what the discussions have been about recently. I say Neymar's tied into such a big deal. Maybe it is Mbappe. Maybe Mbappe is the one that has to seriously think about what happens. But at the same time, there's only two clubs, or maybe three now, Chelsea, but that could really afford him. That's Man City, Real Madrid, really, that could actually go and put the money there. And neither of them really looking to do that right now. Yeah, it's going to be very, very interesting, I think, to, to, to work this one out because we saw what happened when Messi and Neymar played together as a front two without Mbappe in the first leg of this. And it was that PSG were relatively stagnant and couldn't get anything going in the final third. I thought something that was interesting earlier is I saw a tweet from Doogie Critchley, friend of the pod. He said, in 20 years time, they'll ask about the time that PSG had the best player of all time, his heir apparent, and one of Brazil's greatest ever in the same side for two years. You can tell them that they never made a Champions League quarterfinal and they kept two clean sheets in 16 games. And it's a fair point. It's a fair point. If this PSG side couldn't do it, does it need a complete rework of everything about it? And if that's the case, that's an uncomfortable truth for people to face. Yeah, it absolutely is. I mean, it, it, it's it's weird. It's It's a quirk of football, but it also backs up that you can't buy trophies and you can't buy the biggest trophy of all. And I think actually there's some beauty to that. You know, I think that there's a lot to to like about this fact that this hasn't worked. They haven't managed to win the Champions League with literally the greatest three forwards you could have. Like, that's a good thing. I think that's a good thing for football that that that, that doesn't make a great team. Yeah, yeah. Okay, right. Let's move on to the other game tonight, which was Tottenham Hotspur against AC Milan. DJ, you were covering this one. It wasn't a classic. No, a nil-nil. But um, it's a classic if you're AC Milan. I mean, their fans seem to be enjoying it behind the goal. And I think, um, yeah, Tottenham, it was a desperate, desperate night. It It really was. I mean, my first point really is that emotion doesn't win games and it felt like that's what Tottenham were hoping would happen here um before the game Conte was talking about the pressure the environment the fans during the match itself at half time the announcer was saying this is the biggest 45 minutes of our season give us everything you've got be vocal it's like the fans aren't really the problem here lads the problem is those players on the pitch that are just playing with zero tempo in, as you say, the most important game of the season. Pioli said before the game, Spurs won't surprise us. We are too well prepared for everything they could throw at us. He was absolutely right. I think even Milan might be coming away actually shocked at how easy this game was to manage. Until the last half hour when Pedro Porro came on, there was nothing to worry about. Pedro Porro was the first time that Milan had anything any answers to come up with. It was too easy. I'm actually going to give a lot of the credit in this first part where I just really, it's just quick analysis really of, of why Milan won. Krunic had a really good game. He had a really good game in the middle and um, he deserves a lot of praise for that. Um, him and Tonali, I thought, did well. It was helped by the fact that Tottenham, in the setup that they used um, with Hoybier and Skip, they had nothing in terms of drive and creation coming from the centre of that park. And that was like, that was just so obviously lacking at a time when, especially as the first half wore on and it was becoming more and more frustrating, Son and Kane particularly were just not getting in any dangerous situations. Son had another nightmare. Son wasn't in the game at all. Like it was just this game that summed up his season yet again. But I just felt that like Tottenham were epitomised really in this performance by the lack of verve that they had to offer in the middle of the park because of the the way that they play that two-man pivot. And yeah, I thought Milan really found that battle quite easy to win. And it it was quite telling that it was a match where they would have expected worse to come there. Um, So that's really the first part I I want... I've wanted to make of this conversation. And to take it on to number two, something that I think is really important as to how Milan really got over the line. Mike uh, Manuel was back in goal. Um, and he's obviously missed um, long sections of this of this season. Um, Tatarasano has, has been in goal. I think Tatarasano yeah, Tatar was in goal for the first leg. So uh, Manion was, was back here. And honestly, this guy makes so much difference to how AC Milan play in two ways. Firstly, he makes difference to the authority at the back 
and the confidence the players in front of him seem to have, particularly someone like Tomori, who I think still needs guidance, still wants someone shouting at him and like just backing him up. I feel like Tomori's always better, to be honest, when he's got Manion behind him. Um, Most but defenders more are, than to just be what he offers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, true. Um, but more than just that, more than just defensively, he offers a, a quickness of play and a directness that puts Milan on the front foot at times. And he can pick out like Brahim Diaz or Rafael Leal in an instant. He'll ping balls out to them. And that a t- there was a couple of times actually when Tottenham nearly caught, caught out of it because obviously as the game wore on, they were, they were pushing and pushing and Milan were trying to expose those gaps. You were thinking, do you know what? This, this does give them something different. And this is, this is a great thing to have, particularly away from home in a Champions League game where that next goal, it nearly came actually, they nearly scored the second goal. Um, Havoc Origi hits the, hits, uh, the post right at the yeah. end, but um, it, very close to killing it off. Classic were, Havoc, but, um, to be fair. Yeah. yeah. I mean, look, Mayon's my, yeah, my distribution is second to none, really, I think, in the goalkeeping stakes. I think I, I hold it in very high esteem. We talk about Edison, we talk about Alisson, those guys. Mayon has been amazing with the ball. Um, and it was one of the big things that allowed Milan fans to get the, to get over Donnarumma's exit very quickly. Like, they were obviously gutted to lose him. Academy prospect, Milan boy, lost him for free. Uh, to the big baddies PSG and like that is like it was like how the hell are we going to recover from this and they picked up Mignon from Lille and yes he's an amazing shot stopper and he's a great bloke he's been a bit too injury prone for a goalkeeper but it is what it is but it's that distribution you know and it just it 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 just allowed Milan fans to just forget all about Donnarumma because the way he pings a ball 50 60 yards I'd say there's only three or four goalkeepers in the world that can match it yeah, you're right, actually. Yeah, that's that's a big recovery they've made from a moment like that because yeah. they, they were very fearful over what would happen after Donnarumma left and they didn't think they'd ever be posed with that problem, really. They thought he'd say. But um, yeah, that's that's a great point. But yeah, it was, it was a key and I think it's something that could help Milan fare well too in, in the quarterfinals. It'd be something whether they end up facing when the draw's made um, after the next batch they of games. They made that massive save um, as well, didn't they, at the end against Harry Kane's header just before yeah. Havoc hit the post. He keeps he keeps yeah. this game inside ninety minutes there. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I'm pleased about that because this podcast has been pushed back another half hour. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, the game was already delayed like ten, fifteen minutes, whatever it yeah, was. That's the second game up. in but, two um, two days has been delayed. So it's it's very interesting. London anyway, traffic, traffic, man. Traffic. That's where we're at. Right. That's where we're at. Um, okay, what's number three, DJ? Look, lads, the big talking point really, I guess, should be from like, I mean, I'm I'm from a tabloid newspaper world. That's where I, that's where I've I've got my um, my foundations in this in this industry, right? Was this Harry Kane's last Champions League game for Tottenham? Is it Antonio Conte's last Champions League game for Tottenham? I'd say almost certainly for Conte, yes. I mean, I'd be extremely surprised if he's still Tottenham manager next season, and for Harry Kane serious serious doubts now about whether he continues um to play at Tottenham next season one year left on his contract now all he's got left to really push for this season is to get Tottenham into that top four of the Premier League and that is a battle in itself right now as the certainly one of the most inconsistent elite sides in Europe um they're they're so hard to read so hard to get a gauge on and I, I couldn't I wouldn't want to guess whether they make the top four or not. And that's not a great situation to be in as Tottenham, if you're going to that last round of talks to try and convince him to put pen to paper on a deal. And honestly, lads, I think that if they don't convince Kane to sign a contract, I think they consider selling him. I think this is the first time that Tottenham are actually open to selling Harry Kane. I spoke to someone yesterday about this who who usually pours cold water all over everything I've ever asked him about Harry Kane leaving Tottenham. And, uh, Obviously, there was a story about Man United growing, growing in confidence they might be able to get Kane, and uh, and he said, "Do you know what? It's not the chances are not zero. I think is what he said." Yeah. And I was like, "Okay," and basically he went on to describe like the financial element that would be attached to Kane. Like if you think, take him through that last season, he leaves as a free agent. You're talking Tottenham's record goal scorer, one of the greatest Premier League forwards we've ever seen, leaves next year for nothing and you also pay him throughout that that season is 250 300 grand a week whatever it is throughout the season getting into 
10 to 15 million pound, whatever he ends up hitting and across bonuses. So there's that. So you're losing all of that money to have Kerry Kane for that last season. And then you've got to go and replace him anyway, which is going to cost you between 50 and 100 million pounds, however high you want to go and spend. Or you admit, this is we've got to cash in because we can get, we'll try and get 100 million pounds for him. You probably won't get 100 million pounds now, to be honest. You'll get 80, 80, 85, maybe 90. But at least you would get it and you can go and spend that money on another forward straight away. You've got Richarlison, to be fair, already. You've got Brazil's number nine in your squad. <laughs> You've got Son, who maybe could be born again once Harry Kane's gone and you have a new setup under a new manager. Who knows? That's a stretch, but yeah, okay, fine. <laughs> like this is this is, you know, this is a big time for Tottenham. Um very likely to change managers and possibly lose yeah, the best striker they've ever had. Yeah, I mean, what could you do? You, if if Kane goes, can you go and spend fifty million on Evan Ferguson? Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Benfica is the breeding ground of every every great team these days. Is there any? You, you've just watched them uh, in the other game. Anything you can tell us from the Benfica game and a striker there? Is there any anyone that Tottenham could just sign? Well, shall we move there? Um, let Let's go <laughs> to that Benfica game, and there are three main takeaways. And the first one does involve a number nine, Dean. You'd be delighted oh, to nice. know. Uh, I want to talk about the fact I didn't fact even that know that, people. I didn't even know that. <laughs> Gonzalo Ramos is a gunman. And this is the thing that people have been talking about. Lots of clubs looking for number nines this summer. Chelsea and Manchester United have obviously been the big ones. But generally, I think that obviously Tottenham come into that equation and there's going to be plenty of other clubs here looking for... I think Real Madrid will come into this conversation at some point because if we're starting to see the decline of Karen Benzema, then they're going to be looking for an alternative option quite quickly, I'd imagine. I think Barcelona, maybe not next season, but the season after, are going to be coming into a conversation for a number nine. Gonzalo Ramos is starting to hit form at exactly the right time. And the two goals he scores here in this game, Benfica on 5-1 against Club Bruce, 7-1 on aggregate. This was a pasting across two legs. It probably should have been more. And that's quite uncomfortable when you're talking about seven goals in two legs. Like This should have been 10 on aggregate minimum. It should have been maybe four in the first leg. They could have been four nil up at half time here. And it was one. And you're like, oh, okay, cool. Right. This is where we're at. In fact, it was two. But still, it, the point kind of comes that... Ramos's first goal, he dribbles around four players in the box and just rifles one into the corner. And the second goal is this instinctive move across the defender to tuck in at the near post. And he just feels like he's going to everything you want from a number nine. And generally, I think what's going to be really interesting here is we've talked about Enrique Araujo on this show before, who is currently out on loan at Watford who Benfica at youth level thought had a higher ceiling than Gonzalo Ramos. And that's quite scary as, as well as one concept, just in terms of where he's at. He might not reach those levels. We're not suggesting that he's going to be better than Gonzalo Ramos, but there was a, the noises coming out of Benfica's youth system. And the fact that Ramos is just becoming more of more of a rounded player, he can score in the air, he can hold the ball up, he can dribble around players, he can get over the shoulder. There's, more and more of these complete number nines. But everything we've seen from him this season in a Benfica show, he's come in, stepped in, replaced Darwin Nunez, and has thrived. Now, part of this is down to Roger Schmidt's system. It's down to the fact that everyone at Benfica feels like they're a level up from where they were before. But I do believe that he is turning into the one of the most rounded number nines in world football. And there's going to be a big price tag on his head this summer if he is going to go. Mm, yeah, I mean, come on, everyone's going to be in for him, aren't they? He's got he's got a couple of games here now on the Champions League stage. He, obviously, he's got a quarter final. He might even get a semi final. He might even get a final. I mean, Benfica have had such a good season. You just never know. Um, he's got the opportunity here to really stake his claim, and it feel, it almost feels like if he gets if he gets to a semi, he like he wins the right to audition for Real Madrid, whereas. Like if you only get to the quarters, maybe you'll have to settle for Chelsea. Yeah, it's like it's like a tiered system, and it's about how far he can power Benfica and see what kind of win, that move he can win. I mean, we assume that Benfica would be open to selling him 
this summer. Uh, we, we assume that. We don't know. Uh, it'd be a hell of a turnaround. Benfica are usually to open to selling people for the price that they want to sell those people for. That's generally the way, <laughs> yeah. isn't it? So it's going to be another another painstaking summer negotiating with Benfica for someone. I just wonder who that. And lucky then paying the price they want, and then paying the price they want at the end of it. This is how yeah. negotiations go with Benfica. <laughs> Right, let's come on to point number two, which is that this result saw the demise of Scotty Parker as the manager of Club Bruges. Now, I'll keep this one brief, please. I've had, I've had well enough of Scott Parker on this podcast recently. Well enough. 12 games in charge of Club Bruges, who were the winners of the Belgian League last year. On a playoff, they didn't actually win it in regular time. They won it in the playoff system uh, from Union saint gilois But it's been 12 games and two wins for Scott Parker. They were beaten soundly by a club in the relegation to- zone, Stender, over the weekend. And then they lost 7-1 on aggregate to Benfica. That's no huge shame, but the way that they carried themselves, considering this was a side that absolutely fired in the group stages, who people were talking about as a dark horse in the competition, maybe not to win it, but to cause some teams upsets. The difference between the club Bruges that we saw smacking Porto 4-0 at the Jagao and the one that turned up in this kind of blaze of inadequacy at the Estadio de Luz is stunning. And look, I'm not going to go on about it, but whoever thought that this was a good appointment needs their head checked as far as I'm concerned. It looks like Club Bruges are about to replace Scott Parker with Alfred Schroeder, um, which means that maybe they have a penchant for adequacy. Um, but but generally, it is one of those things where from where they were in September, October, thrilling us with some of their group stage performances to where this side are now, the players that have regressed, the players that were left on the bench in this one who were scoring goals for fun and dropping majorly impressive performances in the in in the group stages it, it, it's really quite something to behold and to be perfectly honest with you this has descended into fast even quicker than maybe our biggest skeptics would have imagined so i think this has come to a point where we're looking at the end of scott parker's reign at club bruges and going that'll probably be the end of that for a little while for, for scott parker who felt incredibly out of his depth you've got to applaud i suppose the ability, the desire to go abroad and, and test yourself in a new environment and to take on a job in a, a country you're not familiar with. I, I, I can give that. But the I think he's been exposed at a really high level here. And you look at the other bench and you see Roger Schmidt and what he's done with Benfica. And ultimately, you just see the levels from where these two sides have come. And and that's as, that's as much as I've got on it, really. It's just been a disaster. Are they really going back to Alfred Schroeder, the guy who was like their last manager before this. <laughs> he was he was there in 2022. <laughs> yeah, it does look like that might be the case. So um so yeah, we're going to we, we're going to see what happens next. Anyway, I've got a more positive note to finish on in that Jean Mario is having the season of his life and he is so much fun to watch he had a goal chalked out really early on in this one where the ball comes flashed across and he does a sort of Back heel Croy finish into the far corner. It gets flagged, but a really, really narrow offside. Not on him, on Gonzalo Ramos. And you're like, Joao Mario has never scored that goal. Less than five years ago, that man was on loan at West Ham, trying to trying to sort of scrape games together. And now he's become the first player to score in five consecutive European Cup matches for Benfica since Eusebio. Like, <laughs> the, the levels that Joao Mario has got to this season under Roger Schmidt, a player who was kind of just sort of left out in the cold and who kind of Benfica picked up and were like, yeah, all right, you know, you might be a useful squad player, has become this kind of maestro in the middle of the park. And you know what? I am absolutely loving it. I just want to give some big old praise to Jean Mario and to Schmidt again for unlocking this element of him that has been dormant for, well, what seems like his entire career. He has never been this kind of player. I think he scored more than half of his career goals in the season that we are having right now. And we're in March. Like, this is a player reborn, a Benfica side reborn. And he is the kind of 
talisman of this side all of a sudden he is the one who's stepping up to the mark time and time again he is a creative hub he is scoring goals and he is playing the foot the best football i think i've ever seen from him so just a huge shout out to Real mario because i think a lot of people thought you know when when it all ended up for him that that was going to be kind of the start of his career petering out that he might you know, bop back to, to sporting and maybe be a bit part player. Instead, he's crossed the city divide and he has lit it up at the Luge and got to give major respect for that. Yeah, very good. Um, I mean, sporting fans must be so annoyed because like, he was supposed to, well, he, he went sick. back to, yeah, he went back to sporting. He obviously helped them with the title and that's amazing. But then he was supposed to re-sign. He was supposed to extend his deal. And then he just... Out of absolutely nowhere, went. You know what? I'm going to go play for Benfica now, and it it's just such a bold move. But Benfica fans, obviously, loving it. It's come out great for them. They're gonna they're gonna probably gonna win the title this year, and he's playing the best football I've ever seen him play. Just unbelievable. They could win everything. That's how good this side are. Who knows how it will end? And um, but with that, let's move on to our final game, shall we? Which was at Stamford Bridge, Sam, and this one was probably the game of the week. Oh, it was a good one. Yeah, Chelsea played really well for large parts of it and they deserve a lot of credit. And there's a lot of lot of um, statements coming out of the game from from what I saw on Twitter, a lot of a lot of optimism, a lot of um, a lot of you know turning point statements, a lot of it's clicking. I said that. Is it clicking for Graham Potter? Genuinely, finally, it's been a really difficult three, four months for him. He's talked about that. His squad has doubled in size seemingly in January. He can't register all his players for the Champions League. He can't find any chemistry, any combinations. He has to sift through all these different ideas. And it's been very, very tough. So to see a lot of it come together for once, it just made me it just made me happy for him. And the thing to remember here, I think to take away from this overall is that Chelsea finally played well. Played very, very well. But I think I'll simplify this or distill this down. And my first takeaway is this. Multiple Chelsea players had their best ever game for the club on Tuesday night, in my opinion. So my original take here was that Ben Chilwell just had his best game in a Chelsea shirt. And then it became, well, Ben Chilwell and Kai Havertz have both just played their best games in a Chelsea shirt. Then it became Ben Chilwell, Kai Havertz and Mark Kukurea have just put in their best ever performances in a Chelsea shirt. And then I was like, well, you might as well throw Koulibaly in there, to be honest with you, because (laughs) he hasn't played that well for Chelsea since signing, but he was very, very impressive. So I've got a load of players here. Probably chat Wesley Fofana in there as well. Yeah, (laughs) that's almost like a, yeah, I mean. Graham Potter. Yeah, Graham Potter had his best ever. I mean, it was just, (laughs) it was just one of those nights for a lot of these players, for a lot of these these figures. Um, I, I'd ask you where, where you want to start, but I think we should start with Havertz, um, who was just masterful, you know, and it was just one of those games where, if you didn't know already, this is Kai Havertz as a forward, this is what he is. If you already knew this, it was reaffirmed. He was basically playing as a false nine, and it was masterful stuff, genuinely amazing. And look, he was lucky to get a penalty retake. We will come to that topic later on for one of my other takeaways. So we'll put that, aside for now, but don't let it obscure an unbelievable showing. The movement, the link up, the back heels, he scores that wicked goal in off the crossbar that gets disallowed. As soon as you get those runners off him, you've got Raheem Sterling running in behind off his movements. Give him a runner to locate. Give it let him know. Give him the runs. That's all we've ever asked. Give him the runs. And you know what? Potter cooked up something really, really good here. Havertz and Raheem Sterling as a combo were great. Sterling gets the eventual first goal but Havertz's performance was absolutely sensational it's almost like if you get a runner ahead of Kai Havertz he becomes really useful because he starts to occupy Mm. the spaces in the middle of the pitch that he really likes to occupy and he doesn't get crowded out in those areas Raheem Sterling getting over the top and being on the shoulder of the last man yes he was offside a lot I think that's probably a good thing from a Chelsea perspective, because it means that Havertz is able to occupy those spaces and Joao Felix was as well. And those two in combination in the middle there were a joy, a real joy. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. I I thought it was going to be another long night when Joao Felix missed a really good early chance. It felt very similar to the first leg, but, you know, eventually they managed to get that breakthrough. And look, 
it felt like Chelsea were cursed at certain points because even though Sterling scores that opening goal, obviously the first thing that happens in that sequence is he miskicks the ball completely. And then he has to like yeah. tackle Marco Royce to get the ball back in the box to then absolutely slam it home. And all the frustrations come leaking out in that shot. You can really feel it. But um, listen, the man who sets that goal up, he feeds the ball in is Ben Chilwell. He was absolutely ridiculous. He set up the goal. He won the penalty, if you want to call it that. That's a bit harsh. Um, but he also produced an amazing goal-saving intervention in the second half with the game genuinely in the balance. He steals back around the outside and takes the ball off the attacker's toe as he's just been released through on Kepa. And I saw someone on Twitter say, Ashley Cole-esque. And I thought, absolutely. That was Ashley Cole defending. And that's high praise from Chelsea fans. High, high praise. Yeah. And look, Kukurea, his seeming direct rival for the spot, he plays sort of left centre-back. He played the most un-Kukurea game I think I've ever seen him play. And yet he was very smart, in that very he assured, the ball and very forward. composed. No, in that he wasn't sprinting up and down the touchline nonstop for 90 minutes with his three lungs. He played super reserved, super calm, always behind the ball, very assured. And Koulibaly did too. So well done to each and every one of those four players and congratulations to Graham Potter. It finally just sort of happened for you, which is kind of what we said in the preview, right? We said, you know what? They just need a goal. They just need a goal and it might all start to click together. And you have to have some optimism here if you're a Chelsea fan because it's been tough for the last three months, but maybe, maybe this is that moment. Yeah. Okay. All right. What's your second takeaway then, Sam? The second takeaway, lads, is that Dortmund couldn't handle it, could they? They just couldn't handle it. And and it here is a is a word that <laughs> you struggle to define it's exactly. Doing a lot of heavy is. lifting, yeah. Yeah, but like what I mean by couldn't handle it is like when a football match becomes a fight, you know, becomes an inferno. And like, I don't know, when when the volume is turned up to 11, you really see who copes. And Dortmund couldn't. They couldn't cope. They couldn't cope in the middle of this park. Yes, they were missing some key personnel and losing Brandt after five minutes is horrid. Absolutely horrid luck. He's been their best player in 2023. But they were under pressure from the word go. Under siege, really. And they didn't really offer much in front of goal. Negligible goal threat. Urshan really struggled. I think Bellingham tried to do too much. They brought their substitutes yeah. on. They tried to change the game. Bino Gittens, he also tried to do too much on his own. And they lost a little bit of composure there. They lost the synchronicity. They lost, I think, what makes them very good. All of the, A lot of those players all tried to do too much on their own and lost sight of the sort of team picture. And that stuff happens when you are struggling in games. And that is what I saw from Dortmund. I was disappointed in Dortmund. I was impressed with Chelsea, but it's two sides of the same sort. While one was good, one was not. Yeah, I think it's really interesting to dial in, sorry, on that, on that Bellingham point. I was talking about this with Seb Stafford Bloor on, on the Athletic Soccer Show the other week. In the last season, Bellingham was brilliant, but there were points where he caught, looked around him and thought, no one else is coming with me here, so I'm going to have to try and do it all myself. What's been really lovely to watch about Dortmund in 2023 up to this point is that Bellingham's been able to just do what he does best and kind of control games in the middle and trust everyone else to do their thing. And I think he saw it 2-0 down and he looked around, he went, Julian's not here, Adeyemi's not here. Oh no, you know, we haven't got Kerbal in net. What's going on? And there was a point in the second half, which I thought summed this up really nicely, in that he tried to win a header from Nicolas Sula. And I was like, Sula's going to win that header. He's about six foot nine. Like, there's absolutely no way that he's not going to win that header against Chilwell. But Bellingham jumps over him to win the header, and then the ball gets cleared because the two of them are in each other's way. And I thought it summed up Dortmund's performance really nicely in one kind of key moment. It just felt like Bellingham saw that kind of yellow mist, if you will, and thought, oh, no, I'm the only one who's going to bring us back into this, and suddenly just started from a relatively okay display, I thought, in the first half, where he sort of started doing well to a second half display, which was frantic. And it culminated in a couple of really kind of big challenges where at one point there was one on, on Reese James, which really did look quite nasty to begin with. Um, thankfully, yeah. everyone's fine. And, you know, they shook hands and got on with it. But it kind of like, he almost went, right, I, I've got to I've got to score. I've got to win the headers in the final third. I've got to be the one that gets on the end of the crosses. I've got to win the ball back in the middle. And you're like, you can't do all of that on your own, dude, good as you are. Like, you can't do all of those things. Yes, absolutely. Um, 
in after the first leg, we sat here and did the recap show. And, and my final point on on the first leg of this game and Dortmund, I said that Dortmund sort of struggled to contain their emotions a little bit in the first leg. And, and while they did eventually stick a lid on it, it, it came very close to bubbling over a few times. And that controlling your emotions was going to be obviously very, very important in the second leg. When I said that, I didn't for one second think that I'd actually be talking about Jude Bellingham. I, I thought I'd be talking about someone like Emre Can or Nico Schlotterbeck or someone. But it was it was actually Jude who, who did struggle there. He did struggle to accept that he could only play a certain amount of a role and a certain part in it. And I think he struggled emotionally. And that's that's what led to... He kind of pushed Ben Chilwell away during one of the, the ruckuses with Marius Wolf at one point and then kind of almost kind of made it into something and then realised himself and stopped and then flew in on Rhys James and just desperation, unfortunately. And that's and that's what it was. So, yeah, I didn't think it would be Bellingham I was talking about in those terms, but it turns out on the night it was him. And you're right, he was playing really well until it basically got desperate. Yeah, yeah, that was it. That was, that was where we got to. I mean, Dean, it was a big night for Bellingham and... You can see why it might have might have boiled over. Yeah, I mean he's only nineteen, um, and there's this expectation that he should be able to control any game that he plays in. Um, usually he can, <laughs> but um, you know there are there are going to be some times when he he can't do that, and and that's fine because he's nineteen. Uh, but he turns twenty in the summer, so by that stage <laughs> maybe. <laughs> um, I was actually writing about Jude Bellingham earlier today, and like he's obviously got a decision to make this summer. There's a, there's a lot of teams interested in him. Um, wouldn't be completely surprised if he had one more season at Dortmund. There, there seems to be a feeling that he, he's seriously at least considering that that option. Um, you know, Dortmund are almost pricing him out of move anyway at the moment. I mean, the, the talk, and it, it does seem serious talk, is that they would put. 150 million euro price tag on him um but that that price tag would would change if he signed a new contract and stayed then they could insert some sort of clause for the year after um and you know i can't see i can't see liverpool spending that sort of money to sign jude bellingham right now even real madrid you know they've been in the conversation but they don't want to be spending that right now and I don't think Jude Bellingham can be entirely sure right now where the best move would be for him. At this exact age, Holland took the decision to stay at Dortmund for one more year before he went to Man City. Um, it's a big year. It's a massive year of your progress as a, as a player. Um, and so, yeah, let's see if this was, was Bellingham's last Champions League game for Borussia Dortmund, but it might not be. Mm. Yeah, I don't think it would be the worst decision in the world, if I'm being perfectly honest, for him to stick around for one more year. Uh, but it leads us to our third and final point on this one, Sam. Yeah, a number of ways I could have gone with this one. Um, but I'm going to go with something a bit more general. And uh, I'm going to say that my big takeaway from this, and it's the biggest one because I, this, it, I just couldn't stop thinking about it after the game. Penalties are totally messed up. They're totally messed up. And yep. I think we might need to rethink this from the ground up. Honestly, scrap penalty. Like I just, we need to, we need to seriously rethink this as a concept, because I came out of the game very disillusioned with the idea of a penalty and feeling that they were very, very flawed. And some people will have come to this realization earlier, but it really hit me this one. Kai Havertz gets to retake his penalty, and I've gone through several Twitter threads here to try and figure out what the rules are in certain scenarios, and I've decided. I still don't really know. And that's not that's not good enough. Like that's what that means it's way too complicated. Way too complicated. There are too many eventualities, there are too many rules. And I don't just mean encroachment, which is essentially what Kai Havertz's situation was, encroachment from the Dortmund player, rightly or wrongly. We've got encroachment, we've got whether the goalkeeper's foot stays over the line, we've got rules on what a run up can and can't be. And now we've got IFAB discussing the idea of preventing mind games from a goalkeeper. So they would basically be prevented from distracting or even talking to the penalty taker before the penalty kick because it's it's too easy to put them off. We Emi are Martinez complete... has literally rattled the entirety of FIFA, hasn't he? It takes about 50% of his value off the table. <laughs> but uh, we are completely lost here, guys. Like We are so far away from it's a one kick of the ball from 12 yards and it either goes in or it doesn't. Yeah. We're so far away from that. And we are seemingly so intent on making it impossible for goalkeepers to save a penalty when we now know it's like a 0.85 XG chance, like 85% success rate or something on a penalty. And we're trying to make it even harder. And like, I look at the situation here with Havertz and like, 
the Dortmund player has entered the D, so therefore the area, before the ball has kicked and he has booted the ball away when it comes off the post, so he's encroached. How is he supposed to time his run into the box if players are allowed to stutter and stop and stutter? Like, this is impossible. It's absolutely impossible to do. Why are we doing this? And this is basically what I came out of the game thinking. What are we doing? Penalties are well, massive, a massive, massive yeah. part of this sport. More so, more than Chelsea ever. Chelsea had a player further, further in the box than any of the opponents anyway. They did. Obviously, he, he didn't the, touch the, the ball. Caveat but to this. He didn't touch yeah, the, it. The caveat is that if, if he had touched it and he had scored, it wouldn't have counted, right? That's the that's the flip side yeah, of this but... argument. Mm, absolutely. But like, I just yeah. I really I just think this has really gone way too far. I I'm open to a whole conversation about it in the future. Now is not the time for it. But last night I found myself thinking, should penalties just be like a penalty shootout? You get one kick, it either goes in or it doesn't. And if it's not, yeah. then it's not. It's like a fr- uh, free throw in basketball. You, you throw it yeah, in, ev- it goes in or it doesn't. And then you restart playing. Yeah. Everyone should go and stand in the halfway line. Let him have his kick. If it goes in, then you just kick off again. Anything else, goal kick. There you go. Done. Yeah. Sorted. But, yeah. seriously, but like, I don't, I don't want, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to get this twisted. Um, Chelsea played much better than Dortmund on the night and deserved to win, but they got a bit lucky here. I think if I'm reading the rules correctly, which I'm not sure I am because they're bloody confusing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, we've just decided that we're all very, very confused. Very well, good. My big about it is that the D doesn't count as a part of the penalty box when. Someone gets fouled in it, but it does when you're encroaching. <laughs> it's like, what? <laughs> what's going on? It's, true. it's only use. It's its only, it's only use. use. Yeah. It's for encroachment. It's bizarre, <laughs> isn't it? It's a really, really strange, really strange thing. Um, but it's where we are in the world right now. Uh, and with that, I think it's probably time for us to call it a day here on Champions League Takeaway. Uh, and all the stuff for me to do is to say thank you very much to our rank on Mr. Sam Tai. Cheers, buddy. Thank you very much to our transfer guru, Mr. Dean Jones. Cheers, mate. I've been Jack Collins. Thank you so much for watching or listening here to Ranks FC. Uh, It's been lots of fun working through the Champions League this week. We will be back on YouTube on Thursday morning, where I'll have UE Ultras going live. We will be back on the podcast main feed next Wednesday. And we'll be back tomorrow on our Patreon on Friday morning where we'll be doing the spotlight looking forward to the games the weekend ahead so if you fancy coming and joining us over there of course the link is in the description the free trial month is active at the moment thank you all so much for tuning in and we'll see you very soon take it easy peace At Kroger, you can find the highest quality products at a great price in every aisle, every day with Kroger brand. So you can stock up on your household favorites that are tried, tested, and loved by you. Because when you get the products you love at great prices, it feels like winning. Shop now, in-store, or online. Kroger, fresh for everyone. When it comes to teaching kids and teens about money, practice makes perfect. That's where Greenlight comes in. With a debit card and money app of their own, kids learn to earn, save, spend wisely, and invest. Parents send instant money transfers, create custom chores, and automate allowance, while kids track their spending, set savings goals, and practice money skills they can use today and for life. Get one month free when you sign up at greenlight.com podcast.